turn to the uh, book of Luke, the book of Luke, and uh, chapter number four, the book of Luke, chapter number four, to begin with the message, we will look at verse 33 and read down through uh, verse 37. Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 37. It says, And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this, for with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country Round about. Again, focus on the person today of the Lord Jesus Christ and the authority and power that he has as our Lord and our Savior. And what he has done here in this story and another we will look at later to help the hurting. And I want to speak about those that are hurting today. And the title of my message is Hurting People hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. There are a lot of hurting people in this world today, and oftentimes they hurt others, especially those that are the closest to them, because of the hurt they have inside. They don't even sometimes know that they're doing it, but their hurt that they have on the inside comes out and hurts those that are around them. But we see in this story, just kind of as a launching point, that Jesus Christ can help those that are hurting, uh, even those that uh, have uh, been controlled by powers that are greater than them, and the Lord can help them. Now, my title this morning is what we call a generality. It is not always true, but most times it is true that hurting people hurt people. Some people are have enough discipline and character to not hurt others, even though they've been hurt. And we'll show you how to get that uh, by the end of the message. But a lot of times, our greatest hurts as humans come from other human beings. And sometimes if we'll maybe understand a little bit of who they are or what they're coming from or what they've lived through, it will, it will help us to little, uh, understand a little bit their behavior. I heard the story one time, a true story of a man with his best friend, his dog, and uh, he lived, uh, must have been on a spacious area. I don't remember all the details of this story, but I remember it's a true story, so I'll probably make some of it up, but the point is that, it, I think you'll get the point, was that it, he lived in, on, I don't know, it was a farm or what, but a place where his dog could run free. Uh, most of us live in areas where you, you got leash laws and they can't just run free, but his, his could run free, and he loved his dog, and his dog loved him. I mean, they were, they were attached, and uh, truly, in this case, he was man's best friend, the dog. One day at the appointed time, the dog didn't come home, which he thought was very strange. He would always come home at that time to eat or whatever uh, after running around, and he became concerned about his dog, and he went out to look for his dog. And uh, he found his dog over somewhere on the edge of his property or somebody else's property. Turns out a trapper had set a trap uh, to catch wild animals or, or whatever. And it was one of the snares that you know that's tripped in the middle and then has like teeth and that clamp onto the, the leg of the animal that's trapped in the trap. And so his dog happened to step in it with one of his back legs and, of course, the trap uh, uh, released, and uh, 
dug right into his legs, right through the skin, right down to the bone. And the more that the dog tried to get out of the trap, the worse it got hurt. And the hurt was great. The owner, well, he thought, I'll just walk up to my dog and, you know, undo the trap and let the dog out and let the healing begin. And so as he approached his dog, his best friend, the dog went, <laughs> and attacked his owner. And the owner backed off and didn't know. He'd never seen his dog act that way before. And so he tried it again, and <laughs> the dog attacked him. And pretty soon the owner felt hopeless and helpless because here all he was trying to do was help his dog. He was trying to do what was best for his dog, and the dog did not understand that. And so as a result, the dog lashed out at its owner, its best friend. And why? Why? Because it was hurting. Because it was hurting. And because it was hurting, it didn't realize that when somebody approached to help, that that person could set them free from the trap and the healing could begin. And so they attacked their best friend. We see here a demon-possessed man attacking Jesus. The devil uses the voice of the man to cry out and say, let us alone. Well, that's the worst thing you could say to God. Leave me alone. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? And so this man's voice is used to verbalize what the demon is saying. And the man with the unclean spirit does not realize that Jesus Christ is the one that could help him, the one who could set him free, the one who could deliver him from this. Brethren, most of us, if we've lived on this earth for very long, have been hurt by somebody. And hurting people hurt people. Oftentimes the hurt and the pain is deep and, and somebody approaches us who, who wants to help us, uh, who wants to be our friend, who wants to, be, to set us free. And, and a lot of times we will lash out at that person or we'll lash out at God. Remember uh, one of the ladies in the Old Testament who was hurt uh, so bad by her circumstances a lot of it she brought on herself when she walked out of the will of God for her life. She left Bethlehem of Judea and she went to sojourn in Moab where, where no Jewish girl was supposed to have anything to do with that country. And she ended up living down there 10 years. Her name was Naomi. And while she was in Moab where she wasn't supposed to be, her husband died and her two sons died. If you can imagine being a mother or a wife with that much loss and how much that would hurt. And when she finally decided to come back to Bethlehem, she began to voice her bitterness toward God. And she, the, the city was moved as she approached Bethlehem. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty have dealt very bitterly with me. She lashes out at God because of her hurt. And God's the one who could, could help her. When God is our greatest helper, I want to encourage you, don't ever say to God, let us alone. Leave me alone. Our help is in God. He's the one that can help us with our hurts. Sometimes hurting people lash out at God, or sometimes they lash out at some representative of God. It could be a pastor, a human representative. Could be a pastor, could be an elder, could be a teacher, could be just a Christian in their family. And they will lash out at that representative of God. Why did God do this to me? Why is God? Why didn't God help me? Why didn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't God protect me? And they will lash out. Hurting people hurt people. Sometimes we'll see in a moment here they hurt themselves. They hurt themselves. There's a lot of hurt. What causes this hurt in people? Mostly 
it is abuse as a child. Um, that's what causes most of the hurt we see, in, especially in adults. Uh, they have been abused or neglected somehow in their childhood. Perhaps they have suffered physical abuse. Uh, perhaps they have suffered sexual abuse, verbal abuse that has caused emotional and mental abuse or mental breakdowns. Sometimes it's the desertion of a father or the desertion of a mother uh, that has caused them and their little minds to not be able to reconcile what went wrong in their life or what did they do that daddy left? What did I do that mommy left? Could be a divorce. Sometimes it's a sudden death that causes a person to be traumatized. Other times it's racism or poverty or some health problem that nobody expected and all of a sudden it just pops up in their life. Finances, a failure uh, financially, maybe in a job opportunity or a work or getting fired or some kind of an injustice of many, many kinds. There's so many kinds of injustice. Sometimes it's persecution. Sometimes a believer will be persecuted for their faith and and uh, will become hurting inside. They never expected that to happen. The abandonment of the church. Uh, there's times where people abandon us. Here we are in the Lord's work, the Lord's church, the Lord's army, and people abandon us. They go AWOL. They're deserters from the Lord's army. They never call. They never write. They never give you a phone call. You're just left wondering what why did they leave? There's all kinds of causes of, of hurt. And uh, probably most of you have, have felt some kind of hurt uh, in your life. We have to be careful about this because hurting people often hurt people. A great book to read about that is the book of Proverbs and how it talks about the angry and brawling and contentious woman and how she hurts her husband or the angry, furious man and how he hurts his wife and, and uh, how they may neglect their children and, uh, or, or children may be a grief to their father and their mother. What are some of the symptoms of hurting people? A lot of people, they don't walk around and announce, I'm hurting. Very few people do that. We're a lot of, there's a lot of plastic people these days. Uh, who know how to put on a plastic face in the front, and uh, they don't go around saying, I'm hurting. So we got to recognize what the symptoms are. What are some of the symptoms of a hurting person? Well, here's some. Hurting people use sarcasm in their speech. They're very, very sarcastic when they speak to others. There is that speaketh as the piercings of a sword. But the tongue of the wise is health. They hurt people with their speech. They're very, very sarcastic. Also, hurting people have a critical spirit. They have a very, very critical spirit. They're very critical of people who are trying, uh, people who are, are accomplishing things. They are critical of others because in the tearing down of other people, it's about the only way they can find to build themselves up to criticize somebody who's trying, to criticize somebody when they failed, it builds them up. Hurting people are often jealous. They are jealous at the fortunes of other people rather than rejoicing when other people are blessed of the Lord, when other people get the pay raise or the new house or the, the uh, uh, job or, or have great children or, or a great marriage, they become very jealous. Another symptom is anger. Anger with its biblical bedfellows, wrath and malice. Uh, many people that show anger on the outside are because they're hurting on the inside. Bitterness. We saw bitterness earlier in the case of Naomi. Hatred. Hurting people often use profanity. They lace their speech with profanity for emphasis. I remember the, a couple of ladies one time, I was at a conference and they gave a testimony about their soul-winning endeavors and the one lady was speaking about 
the time when they were out soul winning and going from door to door in their town, knocking on doors, inviting people to their church and trying to talk to people about the Savior, about the Lord Jesus Christ. These two dear ladies, they were elderly ladies. I thought they were elderly ladies at the time, but I was pretty young. They uh, knocked on the door and a man came and before they could even say who they were or where they were from or why they were there, he began to rip into them, he began to swear, he began to curse, he began to tell them where they could go and to get off their property, his property and, and so on and so forth. And these ladies somehow miraculously stood there, smiled and waited for him to be done. When he was done, the one lady said to the man, sir, you have a broken heart. And he went speechless. Because that's what he had, was a broken heart. He was hurting inside. And he thought these were representatives of God, and his, his issue was with God, but he could take it out on God's representatives that day, and he began to curse and swear, and they said, Sir, you have a broken heart. And that opened up the door for them to begin to witness to them and tell them, him about Jesus Christ, the Lord who could heal the brokenhearted. And as they began to speak and share the gospel, God began to move on that man's heart. That God, you don't have to run out and say, let us alone to God, but you can receive God, and God is your help. And they went through the gospel, and I remember how they testified, how that man bowed his head and his heart before God and with tears prayed and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be his Savior that day. And his life was changed. And he got into church, and he got discipled. He began to grow in the Lord and find, found out that the, the God who was approaching him over and over and over again while he was in the trap just wanted to help him and set him free so the pain could stop and the healing could begin. I remember a horse on our farm. We only had one or two horses, and uh, we would just border them. They, they were just with us. One got loose, and we had barbed wire fences all around the fields, and got loose, got spooked, and it ran as fast as a horse can run right into a barbed wire fence. And I remember the barbed wire became wrapped around the horse's body and, and legs, and especially the back leg, and, and how my dad and another farmer began to approach the horse to try to help the horse out of the, out of the uh, trap, the ensnarement that it had gotten into. And, and uh, the horse did not understand why they were approaching the horse and tried to run and pull the barbed wire and the post out. It was just amazing, the, the, the strength. I remember being so spooked I stayed back by the farm. They finally had to get wire cutters and cut the fence down on either side of the horse until the horse, I, I believe, finally collapsed and they were able to cut the wires and take the wires. But to make a long story short, the, the, the horse was scarred for the rest of its existence and uh, also was harmed in its spirit. It never, never was the same again and uh, was confused about what had caused the hurt and thought it was my dad and thought it was the farmer who were just going to try to help and set it free. And sometimes we can be that way as people, those who approach us and try to set us free and sincerely ask us, how you doing? And we, we put up a defense, I'm fine, why are you asking? Why do you ask? I'm fine. Hurting people often become reclusive. They go into a preservation mode where they say, I think I'll just stay away from people. People have been the source of my hurt all my life, so I just think I'll stay away. In fact, I don't even think I'll go to church. But God's work is people. And it is not God's will that we stay away from people or stay away from church. doesn't matter how much we've been hurt in our past. And so these are some of the symptoms that you see of a hurting person. It's sad but true. Hurting people are often contaminated with these terrible symptoms. And they don't even know why. 
They don't even know why. Some of them don't like being sarcastic. They don't like being critical. They don't like being jealous. They don't like having anger and rage and, and, and violent thoughts inside of them. They, they can hide the violent thoughts on the outside so nobody sees the violent thoughts they're having on the inside, the harm they'd like to do to other people, but God sees it. And their storms might not be outward, but their storms are inward. They don't know why they have so much hatred or why they use profanity or why they say unbelievable things to their dear wife that they should love the most or to their dear husband or to their children. Why am I taking this out of my children? And it's because they don't recognize that they're hurting on the inside and hurting people hurt people. I can just remember, and I, I won't bore you with the details, but I remember growing up and having my mother die when I was about four years old, almost five years of age, and my dad became an alcoholic, well, almost an alcoholic. He, he was drunk all the time. That's the way he chose, that's the only way he knew to cope with the loss of his wife. He was only 29, and he had three boys to raise, and we began to be shifted back and forth between our grandparents, and my dad just kind of on a, well, Within a year, married a, a lady that just just made life hard on us growing up in childhood. And a lot of things that we had to live through as boys that nobody should have to live through. And I can remember the hurt. And I can remember the violence, the anger that was in me. I had no clue. I was too young to understand why am I this way. I can remember I, I would take every legal opportunity I had to hurt somebody. By legal opportunities, I mean dodgeball, basketball, football, you know, hockey, whatever. And then I'd feel bad because I hurt somebody intentionally. I was a little juvenile delinquent. I was a vandal. You wouldn't believe the property that I have vandalized with these hands in my past. You wouldn't believe it. I can't imagine the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of damage I did, I've done to people's property with these hands. And, and then afterwards, I would have no clue, no clue whatsoever why I did what I did. But then something happened to me. Jesus Christ came into my life. And he comes in to our lives to do more than just to save us from our sins. Look at verse 18. I love this. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Luke 4, verse 18. Jesus is preaching in Nazareth, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's salvation. There's only one way to be saved, and that's to hear the preaching of the gospel and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the Lord does not stop there. Salvation, the Lord saving our souls, is the beginning of what Jesus wants to do for you and me, not the ending. So that's number one, the preaching of the gospel. Number two, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He is our Savior. He is our healer. As I said, probably most of you in this room have had your heart broken by another human being sometime. And if not, you will. Jesus Christ is the healer of the brokenhearted. And then to preach deliverance to the captives. He is the deliverer. What is the captive? The captive is the one who is imprisoned to their past. They are a prisoner to their past. That's what the word captive means. Jesus Christ is the deliverer of the captive. The captive is the one who is an addict. The captive is the one who has that hard, stubborn habit, that besetting sin that they cannot overcome. They are captives. Jesus Christ can deliver them. The people that I'm talking to more and more and more these days about their pornographic addiction, you would not believe what this world is coming to. Our country is going to become the cage of every foul and unclean bird that the Apostle John talked about in the book of Revelation. I'm reading a study right now where it says 68% of all the men in America who go to church regularly 
look at pornography consistently, 68% of all the men, 40% of all the women, 50% of all the pastors. And uh, I'm looking into a study right now because the, the, the man who is the, the pastor who has come out of that and he has found the victory and he's establishing a, a, a programs to help people in churches. Um, he's, he said he, he cannot believe how many porn addicts we have in church who are exceptional at hiding it. And President Barack Obama said a year ago and, 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 and Governor, or two years ago, and Governor Andrew Cuomo mentioned uh, last year that one out of every four ladies that goes to college or university is either molested or sexually harassed. And is that any surprise? We reap what we sow. And pornography is degrading to women and dangerous to, to children. And man, that thing is taking a root uh, in, in our, our lives and the, the number one segment of our society looking at pornography today is 11 to 17 year olds. It's number one. And sometimes parents, I don't understand this, sometimes parents think, oh, I just love my children. Let me show my love for my children. Kids, I love you. Here's a smartphone. And that smartphone is the stupidest thing you can ever give a kid. Go home. You can borrow my sledgehammer. I'll give you my sledgehammer. Bust it up. Do something to try to save your kids. They're going down. They're hanging out by the libraries and other places where there's Wi-Fi. I've seen them so they can watch pornography. And we're going to have churches filled with porn addicts pretty soon. And the only hope they're going to have is that maybe we can get them to Jesus Christ who can deliver the captives. The drug addicts, the person who is enslaved to the cigarette, to alcohol, to gambling, Jesus Christ can deliver the captives. That's what he said. He said that right there. He said it right there. Recovery of the sight to the blind. That's the person that doesn't know what to do. They need direction. They need illumination. And then last of all, notice this, and this brings us back to our subject. Sorry about the rabbit trail. To set at liberty them that are bruised. The word bruised means the abused. If you have been abused, you do not have to be a prisoner of your past for the rest of your life. I'm talking about people who have been raped, molested, whatever it is. You do not have to be a prisoner to your past. There is help in three proper nouns, the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't come just to save you from your sins so you can escape hell. That's wonderful. But that's just the beginning of what he wants to do for us. And I praise and bless his holy name because when he saved me, all he got when I was 12 years old was a human wreck. That's all he got. By that time, I was already a human wreck. And Jesus Christ has healed me mentally and emotionally and even some of the physical stuff that I have gone through and the abuse. And I want to say to you this morning, I just got two points. Number one, hurting people hurt people. But number two, hurting people can help people. Hurting people can help people. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 real quick, and then we're going to end with one story. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I thank God for those of you who grew up in good homes, had good moms and dads, and don't have a clue of what I'm talking about. You ought to praise the Lord every day and thank God for your mom and dad. But that's not becoming so normal anymore. And the Bible says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be God, 
even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering which he, we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be also of the consolation. Notice that. When we suffer, we're comforted so we can comfort others, verses 3 and 4. One of the things, now God did not ordain the suffering that you went through when you were a little boy or a little girl. That stuff came on you because of Satan. Because the devil gets in people. And gets hurting people to hurt people. Don't blame it on God. Please don't blame it on God. But God comes along to the seeker and, 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 and uh, uh, don't, don't say let us alone when God shows up to help you. You invite him to come in. And you ask the Lord to come into your life and he'll begin this process and then you'll discover he is the father of all mercies, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Hurting people can help others. When you find in Jesus Christ the help for your hurts, the healing for your hurts, when he gets you out of the trap, when he sets you free and the healing begins and the pain begins to go away, it's so the next person you find in a trap, you can say, you know, I, I know the answer here. I know how to help you. Jesus Christ helped me. And let me close by showing you a story of a hurting man who by the end of the story was helping others. Turn to Mark chapter number 5, Mark chapter 5, the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. I'm not going to read the whole story. I believe my own opinion is this was the worst man that ever lived on earth. And I believe God put this man in the Bible so that all would have hope in the future when they read his story because I don't think there's a person in this room who's ever been through what this man has been through. This man was filled with a legion of devils. So many so that when they came out of him and went into the pigs, the pigs ran violently down a steep hill and drowned themselves about 2,000. This guy was contaminated by Satan. And this guy was hurting himself. Hurting people hurt people. He comes out of the tombs in verse number 2 when Jesus shows up in the country of the Gadarenes. That's one of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Gad. And everybody had tried to help him. Let's give him credit, verse 4. I'm sure there were psychologists and psychiatrists and doctors and counselors and, and drug pushers. Neither could any man tame him. And he was hurting himself. Verse 5, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Have you ever run across people like that today? I remember a little girl over at the chapel, man. She took a razor blade, just went to town on her wrist one day. Why? Because she was 12 years old and her boyfriend broke up with her. Now, I know how to solve that. Yeah, don't be dating. Be waiting. Don't date, wait. God has someone special for you. But why was she dating boys when she was 12? Because her father deserted her and her mom and brothers two years earlier for another woman and she could not figure out in her mind why did dad why did dad leave us you know dads you are one of the keys to your kids having sound mental health and emotional health you would not believe the power you have in your role for your children you praise your children you got to discipline them, sure. You got to you got to chastise them when they're bad. I understand that, but you praise your kids, and don't you worry about being their friend, okay? You just be the parent, and you teach them discipline, and you teach them character, and you teach them 
uh, a hard work and, 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 and you, you just build memories with them. And I cannot tell you the, the powerful role that a father has in his children's mental health and emotional health. And that's why little girls do that. That's why people go plaster themselves with tattoos and get all kinds of uh, piercings and, and start cutting themselves and everything because they, they want attention that a father could give them. They want someone to pay attention to them because dad won't. This guy's cutting himself with stones. Jesus comes. The devils speak, but Jesus helps the man. Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. What's your name? Legion. They go into the pigs. They run violently down a steep hill. You know the story, but I, I want to just close. i got to close up here. It says in verse, skip to verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They, they, they never thought such a miracle could take place in a human being. But it can when Jesus is allowed to work. I consider myself a miracle. Certainly one of the most unlikely candidates to ever be a pastor. Just from junk I lived through growing up. But Jesus healed this man, saved him, clothed the right mind, and now the hurting becomes the helper. Let's close with this. Verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, here it is, Jesus commissions him, go home, verse 19, to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. You notice it didn't take Jesus too long either. Now, what did he do with his commission, this hurting man who's now commissioned to be a helper? You go to your town. Tell them the great things the Lord did to you. What do you do? Verse 20, here it is. The hurting becomes the helper. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. See that? He became the helper. He went to Decapolis. There's the, the a region that Decapolis means the ten cities. And he went to those ten cities and just started to publish and tell everybody, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did for me. And it says they were all amazed. They marveled. They marveled. You see, it's not God's fault for the things people did to you. Blame it on sin. Blame it on Satan. Blame it on something else beside God. And it's, it's horrific what people do to each other sometimes. But there is help in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same today as he was in this story. And this man got help from Jesus Christ, from his hurt. He was delivered, and then he became the helper. He went around becoming the preacher. And everybody marveled, said, wow, look what God did for him. You know, it says in Philippians 1 and verse 6, it is God that worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Proverbs 2, uh, Philippians, I, I don't know if I said Proverbs, but Philippians 1 verse 6. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's just going to keep working on you until the day he takes you home to heaven. Isn't that great? God doesn't give up on us. I'm not trying to make light of what you've been through. But I'm saying to you today that God can help you and God can turn you into a minister to other hurting people. Don't blame God for what you've been through, and, but use it. Come to Jesus Christ. Let him be your savior. Let him be the healer of your broken heart. Let him be the deliverer of your captivity. And let him be the one that heals you of your bruises. And abuse. We do not, I'll say this till I die because I, the Bible says it and because I've experienced it, but most of all because the Bible says it, none of us 
have to be prisoners of our past. And none of us have to keep hurting other people. God changed me from a violent juvenile delinquent to a loving husband, a loving father, and I give him all the glory. All the glory. And whatever it is that you've been through in your life, please decide today I'm not going to spend my life hurting people because I'm hurting. I'm going to find the healing for my hurt through Jesus Christ our Lord so that when it goes away, I can start helping people and making a difference in their lives. And man, have we got some days coming. Yikes. This country, you, you would not believe the sin that is being sown in this nation today that's going to lead to violent, abusive acts of people. And we're going to have to be there to pick up the pieces. Welcome them into the Lord and into your church and to tell them there's help and there's hope in Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, help us today to become able ministers of the New Testament. Lord, we pray. Father, help those that are hurting this morning to realize that they do not have to live the rest of their life, that Jesus came to do more than to just save them. That's just the beginning of what the Lord can do for us. Our Heavenly Father, we pray you'd bless now this invitation and time of prayer. And we pray that everybody would leave the church with hope today, that Jesus Christ can help them. And Lord, some of us have hurt people. I think of the Apostle Paul. Man, did that guy hurt people. He just went around hurting people but then you saved him. And he became one of the best Christians the world's ever known. God, help us to become great Christians. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to page 168, 168. Here's a great thought. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. I don't know what you've gone through, what you're going through right now, what you're struggling with. Maybe you're here this morning, you're saying, I don't know why I act the way I do. I don't know why I hurt my kids, my husband, my wife, other church members. I don't know why I'm sarcastic. I don't know why I'm critical. Why am I jealous? Why am I angry? Why do I have these violent thoughts in me? But if you'll be transparent today with God, I think God will meet you. God will help you today. Someday in your life, you're going to have to be honest and humble like I was and say, Lord, I'm full with so much violence. God, I need your help. I'm hurting people. You want me to spend my life helping people? You're going to have to help me with this. And God has helped me. I know he'll help you. Won't you stand with me sing, does Jesus care? Won't we come around this altar today and just pray for God's help again today? Pray for God's help. <laughs>